Showing on this episode of Law Weekly, we discuss issues of the financial autonomy of the judiciary against the background of the nationwide strike embarked on by the Judiciary Staff Union of Nigeria, JUSUN. We have the views of a former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Olisa Agbakoba, who had filed suits in 2013 to challenge the governor's reluctance to implement the financial autonomy. We also have updates on the judiciary strike, plus the Lagos Public Interest Law Partnership, PILP, holds its 2021 Pro Bono Week and launches its online access to justice portal. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shieli. Before the decision of Joson and the Nigerian Bar Association to embark on the nationwide protest, I sat down with a former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Ulisa Agbakoba, who maintains that the simple way out of the judiciary strike is for the state governors to obey the rule of law and the judgments of the courts with regards to the implementation of the financial autonomy of the judiciary. He recently wrote a letter to the chairman of the governor's forum, the governor of Ekiti State, Dr. Kayo De Fayemi, urging the governors to save the country from the chaos in the judiciary. He spoke to Law Weekly about this and other issues. The judiciary is the third arm of government, but it's not treated properly. It's not treated adequately. We all know the chaos in the judiciary, lack of judges, lack of manpower, lack of everything, lack of facilities, lack of houses, improper pay, interference with the judiciary, jumping into their houses, raiding their houses, everything. So we all know it. So the least that they can do is respect the Constitution. And the Constitution is so clear, judges and the judiciary are independent in terms of funding, and their funds would come straight from the revenue post of the federal government, not controlled by the executive or the National Assembly, or indeed the governor or the House of Assembly are independent. That's what the Constitution says. Now, on the at the time I was member of the NJC and I brought this up, I was surprised that Aloma Mukhtar, then Chief yeah. Justice, was not keen to take it up. And I said, no, my, my lord, I disagree. If the NJC will not, then I'll do it personally, which I did. And I took it to two states. I took it to Ekiti State. Not because Fahemi was there, because he wasn't the governor at the time. But I took it to Ekiti to represent the state judiciary. And I took it to Abuja to represent um, the federal process. And I won in both cases. And Juson also went. So there are three independent court cases verifying and confirming that the judiciary ought to be funded according to the constitutional provisions that makes it independent of the executive. Okay, we'll build it in now. They won't. That's the problem. What, how would you react to the comments by the state government at the center of this controversy that they are arguing that the order number 10 the executive order number 10 is unconstitutional, particularly the part that empowers the accountant general of the federation to withhold monies due to the judiciary from source. Yeah, because the constitution is not an enforceable document unless somebody executes it. It's not self-executing. Somebody must execute it. Who is the person? The president. Look at section 5. The president is responsible for the maintenance and sustenance of the constitution. So in exercise of his powers under Section 5 of the Constitution, he has issued that um, executive order. I'd like to see it interpreted in the Supreme Court to see if I'm wrong. But clearly, what he has done is constitutional. So the president is simply saying, don't pay it to the governor of X state. Pay it to either the NJC for capital, um, uh, for CAPEX, or for OPEX, operational expenses. Pay it to the local judiciary. What's wrong with that? He's actually, in fact, the president should get praise. He's normally knocked on the head for doing the wrong things. This is when he should be praised for doing exactly what the constitution prescribes. But they were saying they weren't carried along in the process. Do they have to be carried along to obey the constitution? They don't have to be carried along. It's not their money. The issue of financial autonomy also brought to the fore the issue of accountability for budgeted funds. Do you think that an independent body should be created to perform that function? If you look at the, 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 the fiscal responsibility in the Constitution, I've argued without success that the Office of the Accountant General and Auditor General should be as important and secure as the Office of the Chiefs of Nigeria. Because if you want the Accountant General and the Auditor General 
to perform the role prescribed in the Constitution. They can't for the simple reason that the president of Nigeria, and a president actually did it, and the president that did it was OBJ, he fired the Auditor General. So no Auditor General can actually conduct and police public revenue because they are weak. So we need to see a guaranteed tenure for these offices so they can do their work without fear of favor. But the way it is now where they are in the civil service, they can't do anything. So when you talk about auditing public funds, who's going to do it? Everyone wants to keep his job. I don't blame the Auditor General or the Accountant General. If he goes and audits something, next thing he's sacked. So the entire framework of uh, public revenue and its audit is something that requires constitutional amendment so that these offices have full guarantee. If I put you there as uh, Auditor General, it will not be at the pleasure of the President. It will be as a result of the combined provisions of interlocking offices. The President plays a role maybe in nominating, the National Assembly plays a role in the confirmation, and the money budgeted for the Office of that Auditor General is free from executive or legislative interference. Then you will see these guys do their job. But for now, no. We don't have audits in Nigeria. That's why corruption is so rife in the public service. Does that mean that the, even the funds generated by the judiciary is not audited? It's absolutely not audited. You're, you're talking about the judiciary. What about the, the other one, executive? They haven't even finished auditing the executive to speak of the judiciary. So the entire public revenue structure needs to be disassembled. Oh, I also want to get your comments to um, this suggestion from Chief Afeb Babala SAN, who during the week proposed 100 years as retirement age for Supreme Court justices from 70. Is it a realistic suggestion? At 100, how many Nigerians can walk? It's too old. And I get his point, I get his point. The point is, the older the judges, the more wise you become. And the sage of a judge doesn't come from him being 40-something. It's when he's old and reflective. So I think the point he's making is not so much that 100 years. I don't know how many Nigerians get to 100 anyway. Did your father get to 100? He didn't get to 100. So the point is, 70 might be a bit too early. And I think so. Se 70 is when the judge, when I can think of Oputa, I can think of uh, a show, I can think of all, all of them. They were their peak. I mean, a show after he finished, went on to a very active life in arbitration. He could just continue to 90. So if that's the point uh, my learned senior affair is making, I, I agree, but I disagree about the, I agree with the policy that 70 might be too early. Because look at Body Rose Bible. He can go on to another 20 years. So I, I accept entirely. Because in America, as you know, judges are there for life. And they give great decisions. Thurgood Marshall and all of them give great decisions as they age. Because that's what our wig is about. I'm sure nobody knows this. Uh, the wig we wear on our head. It's about wisdom. The fact that your hair is grey. If your hair is black, you're not a wise person. So it needs to be grey. And I agree entirely at 70. We need to review it. The issue of qualification and caliber of judges to be appointed has also been very topical lately. Against the background of the comments made by the president of the NBA that some judges at their screening for appointment could not answer basic legal questions. We've heard the President of the Court of Appeal come out to say that, well, judges can learn on the job. There's room for them to learn on the job. Where do you stand on that debate? Yeah, it's a good question. You see, the thing is, I think now is the time to begin to consider removing the veil of secrecy over these judicial appointments. Because it's all secret. You know, nobody knows what's happening. Take the appointment of an American Supreme Court judge. <laughs> you, know, you know how it is. It's grilling. All kinds of questions. What's your opinion on gone, gone? What's your opinion on everything? Here, yeah, nothing. So I go back to the cause of all this problem, the military. Who became terrorized, incidentally, by us in the human rights community, when we said, don't touch the judiciary. So the judiciary took it 
and I've taken it a bit too far. So everything is secret. And along came the most improbable person to recommend roots and branch reform of the judiciary in the shape of the late Justice Dahiru Mustafa. He was the most unlikely person. I could never believe it. Because when he was here as presiding judge of the Court of Appeal, and I used to appear before him, I just felt this was a conservative person. Lo and behold, he became Chief Justice of Nigeria. It was a transformation. He called together 29 top people, I was part of them, to sit and advise him, what do we do about the judiciary? And we produced a fantastic report. How can a judge or an aspiring judge not answer a question? He's failed. If he can't answer procedural questions, no problem. He will learn that on the job, uh, how to tap the registrar and how to call for paper. But if he doesn't have substantive knowledge, he doesn't qualify to be a judge. There's no question of learning. But because we don't know, after all, I wasn't there. If you didn't tell me, I, did, I wouldn't have known. But because president of the NBA, Ulu, but I was there. So we know. So all the structural defects in the judiciary require to be removed by the simple implementation of the Dahiru Mustafa report. The structure of the judiciary requires to be modernized in the context of having speedy and efficient dispensation of justice. But right now, apart from the secrecy that I've alluded to, where we don't know what happens, everything is hush-hush, which gives rise to any number of gossips. And a lot of times, these gossips may not be true. So an active information process by the NJC will be relevant. But at that point that I've made all through the years is, I don't understand why, and I'm 43 years now at the bar, if I don't understand it, I don't know who else would. Why is it that this is not just the judiciary, everything in Nigeria, there's like one head in control. So for the judiciary, there's a CJN controlling everything. I think it's time to unbundle and unpack. So you find that there are 36 states in Nigeria, all with different ramifications. So take a complex land matter in Onitsha between Onowu family and Ofodile family, understood by the people around. The Court of Appeal in Enugu or Asaba, which deals with Odisha, has the presiding judge, Mr. Justice Bello, who is from Kebi. Because that is what the national uh, judicial process says. He has no idea. Or you have a Mr. Justice uh, Obi sitting in uh, Kaduna. He has no idea of the difference between Northern Kaduna or Southern Kaduna, that, that, that there's a bridge. I know this because I was born in the North. But the guy has no idea. And part of the smooth delivery of justice is that you understand the community. The same with policing. If you take Commissioner of Police, Dan Zauzal, to Enugu, and then take uh, Mr. Okafo to Zaria, he's lost. He's lost. So it's time, and that's part of the argument of restructuring. Because all what I'm saying deals with the larger national issue. Let's really allow the states to breathe. Let the judicial process in the state breathe. Let the process in Anambra State be a process that is homegrown. And let us end the judicial process in Anambra State. Because it's ridiculous that the Supreme Court will be dealing with cases. This is what, 2021? They are dealing with 2015 cases. Because everybody's running there. And I can assure you, when I was deputy chair of the uh, Speed of Justice Committee, chaired by Belgori. We both agreed with our committee members, 75% of the cases in Nigeria should not be in the court in the courts in the first place. 90% of cases in the Supreme Court should not be there in the first place. Unfortunately, in the Supreme Court here, there's no filter. In the American Supreme Court, there's a filter. They won't even sit. They'll throw it out. The way to go to resolve this problem that I'm describing let the Supreme Court be unbundled. Justice Bode Rosvaibo should have been the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Lagos State, not the Supreme Court of Nigeria. 
he will do effective justice here. He has added nothing there. And so on for the other justices. So those who go out to become justices of the Supreme Court will be few. And their caseload will be tiny. The bulk of Nigeria doesn't have to go to the Supreme Court. So that's the point I'm making. Welcome back. It's not yet certain when the judiciary workers will call off their nationwide strike, which is now well into its third week. The leadership of the Nigerian Bar Association had directed its branch chairman nationwide to mobilize their members and visit their respective state governors to demand for the implementation of the financial autonomy of the judiciary. Let's give you an update on how that went. In compliance with the directives from the leadership of the Nigerian Bar Association, members of the association on Monday, the 19th of April, marched to the National Assembly in solidarity with the judiciary workers who are demanding the implementation of the financial autonomy of the judiciary. There was a mild drama as the security officials refused to allow them gain entrance. The protesting lawyers led by the first vice president of the NBA, Mr. John Ikopo uh, Martins, however, stood at the entrance of the National Assembly, insisting there would be no entry nor exit until they were allowed in. In Edo State, representatives of the members of the Nigerian Bar Association from the different branches in the state also embarked on a walk to the Edo State Government House in Benin City, the state capital, to appeal to the state government to comply with the constitutional provisions on financial autonomy of the judiciary. On arrival, the lawyers were also not allowed access into the premises as the chief security officer cited COVID-19 protocols. He also informed them that no member of the executive was available to attend to them. In River State, Governor Yes on Wike threatened to suspend the implementation of financial autonomy for the judiciary if the court workers in the state continue with their strike. In Delta State, the lawyers stormed the entrance of the state government house in Asaba, where they were received by the Commissioner for Justice, who assures them of the readiness of the state government to implement the provisions of the Constitution as regards the financial autonomy of the judiciary. In Ondo, the lawyers drawn from the five branches of the NBA in the state displayed various messages on placards to express their demands. In Yobe, the Judiciary Staff Union of Nigeria and Parliamentary Staff Association of Nigeria joined the nationwide peaceful protest too. This was the same scenario in Taraba and Zamfara State, where members of the BAB marched alongside members of the Judiciary Staff Union and the Parliamentary Staff Union. There was a bit of controversy in Lagos as a Keja branch decided to do a solo protest on Monday, led by its chairman, Bartholomew Agwebodo. <laughs> Members of the branch walked from the bar center of the Lagos High Court in Keja to the governor's office in Alausa. There was no member of the executive on ground to receive them. But the very next day, which was Tuesday, Governor Babajide Sonwonlu received the four other branches in the state. Cameras were not allowed into the meeting, but the governor pleaded with Jason in the state to go back to work, as the executive was not owing the judiciary. Hours after this meeting, the Lagos chairman of Jason by an addendum relaxed his strike rules to allow for partial work in the courts. But hardly had the statement gone out when the national body countered the directive and insisted that all courts in Lagos State remain shut until there is full compliance with financial autonomy nationwide. Meanwhile, members of the Judiciary Staff Union of Nigeria on Wednesday staged a walkout from the reconciliation meeting with the federal government and representatives of the state governors. The striking judiciary workers staged their walkout after waiting for over an hour at the conference room of the Minister of Labor and Employment, where the failed meeting was to be held. Away from issues of the strike, the Lagos Public Interest Law Partnership, PILP, has held its 2021 Pro Bono Week. The week had the team, digitization of access to justice. And one of the highlights of the week was the launch of the online access to justice portal. What is that about? We have details in this next report. 
The Public Interest Law Partnership was conceived by the Lagos State Government in 2012 as a public-private partnership with the main objective of bridging the gap in access to justice by providing free quality legal services through a pro bono network for individuals and NGOs underserved by other public systems. The 2021 Pro Bono Week of the organization had events which focused on a wide variety of issues in the access to justice space, including the growing use of technology to enhance pro bono services, particularly as a result of the pandemic, prison congestion, new developments in tackling sexual and gender-based violence, and providing legal assistance to small business owners of limited means. The closing plenary of the week, which brought all of these people together, with many more joining online, is an interdisciplinary evening showcasing varied approaches to societal problems. First, a presentation by a Netherlands-based research company, Artstrap, which is collaborating with the PILP. Their research shows that Ikoyi Prison, which is the largest in Lagos, has 90% of its inmates awaiting trial, most of them with no legal assistance. And in partnership also with the Lagos State University and the theatre team, they've come up with an informal justice court project, which among other things, seeks to help the prisoners prepare for their criminal case with the help of pro bono lawyers, as depicted in this short performance. This was closely followed by a roundtable examining some of the issues thrown up in the play and the challenges with implementing alternatives to pre-trial detention. What we intend to do is to train the magistrates, give them awareness about plea bargain, so that when the defendants come to court, the magistrate tells them, explains the process to them, and tells them, do you want to explore this option? The role of the defense lawyer is critical to implementing alternatives to pre-trial detentions. And so, the discussions examined what role the NBA can play in encouraging lawyers to consider plea bargain and other diversionary measures that aid the congestion of the correctional facilities. The most important thing is justice and getting it as fast as possible. That is what is most important to us. But for the charge and bill lawyers, they have commercialized it. The more they go to court, they charge on per court basis. So they don't want the case to end. So that is one. And for those who want to attain silk, they know that it's when they get to trial that that case will count in their favor. So for instance, if you plea bargain, you have about 10 cases, and you plea bargain in six, is there a gain for you? That is for those who want to attend the six. So you need to address these issues. The deputy vice chancellor of the University of Lagos dwelt on global best practices on pre-trial detentions. Um, ensuring that cases that should not go to trial at all do not go to trial at all. And that requires a lot of vetting ahead of time. And I know that Lagos State again has introduced that beyond the DPP's advice, beyond the traditional, oh, it's gone for DPP's advice, so that you do not, you do not go to court at all for what is not worth it and what is just going to keep people on the inside. After the round table, the Attorney General representing the State Governor launched the online access to Justice Portal. You can now visit www pilp.ng to gain access to all the public interest services that PILP has to offer. 
Awards were also given to deserving law firms and organizations who have partnered with the Public Interest Law Partnership to offer free quality legal services to the public. The partnerships has produced over 3,000 beneficiaries in 798 cases till date. And that's our program this week. Don't forget that you can find these and past episodes of the program on our YouTube page. I'm Shalashi Ali. Thank you for watching and see you next week. <laughs>